And oh, good morning, Cindy. I know it's early for you. I'm sorry. You're very special for me to turn on my camera before 6 a.m. Uh, I'm honored. Um, we're right at the top of the hours, at least by my, we'll give folks a few minutes. Um, yeah, and I'll put into chat um, the link to the, where we'll take notes in the agenda page. Um, Oh, interesting. Okay, there we go. Oh, oh, actually, I have a question. Is the, Do you have to have a data tracker account in order to participate in this? Yeah. You do. You do. See, that's a shame. Because I, I, um, I suggested some of the colleagues at the WIPE NCC if they wanted to listen in just to learn how you do things, but I guess they can't even join. Well, uh, it is true. There's an extra hurdle. Anyone can create a data tracker account. Um, yeah, I didn't does. realize that. I should have told them before. They're probably now going like, ah, how does this work? But yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. I'll tell them. Um, I'm not sure whether um, I'm trying to put the link into chat for the notes page, but I'm not sure if it's coming through. I don't see it on my chat. Oh, I know why. I have to authenticate to Zulip. Interesting. Yeah, no, it should, it's coming through on the Zulip. Are, are other people seeing it? Nope. No, and I just tried to send something myself and, and see it. I saw, I saw that um, someone said something about they created the Zulip stream for it this morning, so maybe something is wonky there. I yeah. can take a look. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, Alessandro uh, noticed that somehow in the... Um, setup of this and we'll talk a little bit about this as well set up in this group that the zulip stream wasn't automatically created for it um so i don't know if that's a, a bug in uh the group creation process and data tracker um well so zulip streams are not created automatically we have to do that manually and i, I didn't realize this one was using Medico this time i assumed it was using zoom like last time so i didn't even check okay okay sorry uh, AJ, um, we're just getting started. I'm, I think we'll give folks about three or four more minutes. Um, Hi, I have my new laptop now, so things work. Yay. Ooh, exciting. Yeah, very much so. Imagine that actually having something that works really properly. Fantastic. Um, I think for the interim, uh, what I'll do is I'll just share my screen if I can do that in a way that, yeah, hold on here. Okay. <clears throat> It'll be a little, little awkward, um, but it's also available from the data tracker uh, entry for this meeting, the, the notes page. Um, and here we go. Yes, and share window, and I want that window, share that window. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, it's a little bit small, but we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> um, okay, can other folks see my window? I see my own window, but... I can see that whole window plus a bit of black on the side, which I imagine is just the way it displays it. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, well, we'll just use this. This is, you can kind of tell from the address bar up there where this is. If you go to notes.itf.org, you can see the, uh, you can find this by just searching ITFLC, <clears throat> and then you can enter it indirectly, but um, for the moment. Okay, 
alphabetize, alphabetize this later. Okay, we're about five minutes after the hour, and um, um, I, I think we'll just get started uh, again. If uh, yeah, I guess everybody's sharing video, um, so we'll just treat this as a roundtable. I'm gonna I'm gonna basically run this as we did <clears throat> the last meeting, where I'll do most of the talking, but interrupt me if some questions come up. Um, so thanks for coming. Just to recap and for folks watching this video uh, later, um, this is the ITF LLC comms uh, call. And the purpose of this call is to just give folks an update and allow questions about and discussion of the comms activities that the LLC is undertaking on behalf of the ITF. Um, this is very much modeled on the tools team calls, where the idea is this is a small group of people around um, a virtual table in this case, and um, folks should uh, feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Um, uh, the discussion for this group um, currently will take place on the admin dash discuss email list. So if you're watching this video and you have questions, feel free to contact me directly or uh, you can raise questions there. Um, <coughs> we're um, again uh, complimentary to EODER. Education Outreach Directorate and other activities. Uh, this is not intended to replace that. So please continue to be engaged in those groups if you're interested in um, sort of the broader community discussion about education and outreach. Um, I think we all know each other, um, so we don't really need to do introductions. Um, but just to note that we are using now the, um, as was requested on the first call, this is the second call of this kind. Uh, that we sort of integrate into the usual data tracker flow, so things show up on the official LLC, uh, sorry, official ITF agenda uh, or meeting calendar, and so this call does appear there. Um, and we are using Medico, uh, which is great, and this call is being recorded, and uh, it, the video will be posted to the ITF YouTube channel afterwards. So um, we're very much in the general ITF process or, or working process flow for this call. And there was a question about um, what comms means, <laughs> and I realize it's ambiguous in this context. So uh, in the ITF context, so for this call, we're talking about basically marketing communications. You can see the definition in the in the notes page. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what we're, we're talking about here. So. Um, with that, I'll pause. I'll, I'll see if there's any questions about what we've covered so far and any suggestions about other things that people would like to cover that aren't already covered in um, the draft um, agenda that's in the notes page. OK, counting to six. This could be a pretty speedy call. But um, yeah, happy to take discussions along the way. Um, so we talked a little bit about this last time. Uh, we uh, And this is part of the ITF LC strategic plan and has been really since 2020, the idea that we are using um, the uh, journey map or user journey map um, uh, uh, process or modeling <clears throat> approach to really understand um, how people engage with or, or could engage with the ITF. Um, I have to say that the, the key thing for me to remember about this is that it is a model. It's, it's not actually intended to be like a, in itself, a 100% um, uh, uh, authentic to any particular individual um, description. It's, it's really intended as a, as a tool and a model. And so we're not trying to map every possible mode of interaction we're trying to pick some key ones and um, to inform the model uh, with information, either through interviews or data we collect from website stats, et cetera, um, but, and to update models using those things. But um, it is always important to remember it's just a model. And the key components are that it's a particular individual who is trying to accomplish a particular task. And so the model helps you understand the what's needed for that person to accomplish the task, the obstacles they might face, how you could improve their ability to achieve the task, and those kinds of things. So um, there are three that we're looking at in particular. Um, 
Uh, Greg, yes. one question. Uh, is this limited to ITF.org or does it include everything, Data Tracker, Wiki, everything that we own? That is a great question and it is everything. It is intended to touch on every potential tool, experience, interaction uh, that a person has. So like a really um, like non-ITF example is if you're on a cell phone plan, a mobile phone plan, and you want to change to a different provider, what uh, a, pro a mobile phone provider might map out what that experience is like when a person comes to them, you know, what their initial um, research looks like, uh, where they get that information, how they make their decision, how they actually do the sign-up process. So that could involve online web search, going to a store, interacting with customer representatives, uh, all those aspects. And the same is true here. So yeah, it's very, it's, it's intended to be holistic. That's a great point. Yeah, that's great. I was going to ask the same because, of course, especially the first one, you know, would obviously involve a lot of the tools, um, you know, how to interact with the tools. And um, I think it would be really um, important to inc in include all this. So I, I, I really welcome these activities. I think that's really will help be very helpful for new participants. <clears throat> yeah. And if you if you if you uh, there's a link in the notes to what is a really good article about uh, journey maps and um, by the Nielsen, it's Jacob Nielsen and somebody else who I never remember, uh, their group who does a lot of uh, user stuff. And they explain where journey maps fit into the entire, you know, experience or map and uh, user stories, those kinds of things. Those are other kinds of tools. Um, so one thing I would point out here is these are the three that we've we've picked out and we've done some initial um, research on them. Um, if there are, if we can't be comprehensive, uh, it just it wouldn't be possible. But if there are other good exemplars of journeys that people take around the ITF that you think would be worth considering, uh, yeah, th those would be great suggestions. Okay. Cool. Um, just a quick note here on www.itf.org, uh, Jay uh, and I have been talking to a lot of folks and uh, working on ways to um, improve www.itf.org, so that specific website. And um, Jay may want to say more, but I, I, at this point, I just wanted to give the high level um, uh, takeaway that the, the main goal is to make information easier to find and more uh, comprehensible to, especially to either new or non-ITF or potential ITF participants. Um, the current site's navigation is limited by particular um, uh, uh, ways that the CMS, the content management system works and the content hadn't really um, uh, been holistically looked at to make it, make it better. Uh, and more understandable. Do you want me to add to that, Greg? Yeah, please, Jim. So basically with our website, we we face three problems. Um, one, as uh, Greg said, is that the CMS um, is too rigid in the way that um, page structures and menus are created. So um, basically you um, create the pages in a hierarchical folder structure on the in the web cms and then that's reflected in the menus or in the urls um, uh, so that you know so that you automatically are just forced to have relatively long urls with multiple levels in them um, we wanted to um, get away from that to have you know short urls so that uh, you don't uh, so you can just have a direct url something www.itf.org slash something okay um, because that's easier for people to um, uh, to, to, to recognise as being the subject matter that they might be after or something. Um, it is a, a big thing about the way that people interact with sites is the ability that people have to understand whether what they're looking at or what they might look at is the information they're written. So, so that's part of um, one of the things we're doing is dealing with that. Um, the second thing is the quality of the content. There's um, 
lots of um, content that is almost there because somebody thought, right, well, we have to have something about this, but didn't really, there wasn't the effort put in to ensure that what was there about that thing was the the level or the depth that was necessary for people. Um, so we've done a, a lot of um, work on uh, taking the DAO, which were um, which had a lot of content in it, and turning that into web pages. So um, if you take, for example, there's one underneath um, uh, standards about intellectual property. We now have a much more detailed but straightforward page there about intellectual property for people to read. We have a better one about how working groups work, for example. Um, so the, the the content was there, but it was just, you know, in various different bits in some cases or just wasn't there. It, it, you know, it was, we made life very difficult for readers of our website. Um, so we're working on the content to try to do that, reduce the, the duplication, make the content more usable for people more and more e easily found. The, the, the bigger thing, though, um, that, that Greg and I spent a lot of time talking about and mapping out is about how people um, understand what, how people engage with us and how people understand what they want to do and what we are, um, what they have, how to find things effectively on our website. Um, so, um, sorry, my screens have suddenly told me they're going to turn off power off. Right, let me deal with that quickly. Um, okay, so um, the um, uh, to, to give you to give you an example, we have a current thing on our website that is um, standards, uh, internet standards. We have that as a navigation item. So, we've about us, topics of interest, participate, internet standards. We have a lot of stuff that goes on within the IETF that is not internet standards. Um, it's, you know, informational RFCs, experimental RFCs, all sorts of things. Um, we have this, also we have this big problem that the IETF uses the word IETF to mean two separate things. It means it as the umbrella term that includes um, RFCs, the IAB, the, in some services, even the IRTF, you know, we talk about IETF meetings for example, in that type of way. Um, and we also talk about it very specifically when we talk about the bit under the control of the ISG and the standards things. So somehow we need to unravel this complexity in a way that people that is relatively straightforward for people to find things and to um, get to the right information and understand things. So um, some of the things that we've been looking at within the um, within the website and within the website structure are about um, directly speaking to the person there, you know, which is what participates um, is on the current menu. Um, it's a, you know, it's a call to action. This is how you come in and this is how you participate. And then understanding what that means, you know, that, it, that what we need to be providing people there is the is knowledge of the set of skills they need to participate as well as providing them knowledge of how they can come in, you know, where the entry points are. That that sort of, you know, um, level of uh, uh, thought about how people navigate and understand and uh, engage with our website is um, going to require quite a, a change to the um, uh, to, to the, the, the whole net website navigation. So that's largely what we're working on. Um, and as Greg said, in order to enable that, because of the problem of the CMS, we've had to have some technical development done um and the, the the final thing just to note is that um our, our website is not very modern if you were to say go and you know look at apple's website which is always one of the best modern ones and you were to go and look at a specific piece of equipment on there like the latest laptop um you, you get that type of scroll thing where you scroll and the screen appears and it, it tells you all about this particular feature and then you scroll and the next one slides into view and it tells you all about that it's a technique for providing you a uh, significant density of information in a manageable process for you to be able to take it all in, read it, navigate it, things like that. All we currently have on our website is pages. That's the only mechanism that we have. And so if you want to get a lot of information across, such as the guide to ITF meetings, you have a very, very long page with a um, heading at the top. So, so 
Greg and I again are trying to, you know, get some um, new features added that will enable us to present large volumes of information in a, in a more usable way. So without having prepared that speech, that's basically a, a, a sort of high level synopsis of where we are. Yeah, thanks, Jay. I've, I've taken notes as you were um, speaking. Hopefully I've captured them properly, but um, please add uh, what I've missed or correct what I've gotten wrong. I'm just pausing. I, I noticed someone has joined us. Um, uh, and uh, just to repeat what I said at the top of the call, if you're able to share video, we're, uh, that's great. If you're not, that's also fine. Um, but we're very much, um, well, hey, hello. Welcome. Hi. Hey. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to let you know that we are um, operating very much in a round table. And um, if you have questions and want to jump in, please do. Also, I am sharing on the screen um, the notes and slash agenda for this meeting. Um, uh, you should be able to see it, but if, uh, if you want to pop it into your own browser window. Um, unfortunately, I don't know, Cindy, if the chat is working now for this. If you, I haven't looked. I'll try the chat again. Um, um, I do have the link. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I can also just introduce myself quickly. Um, my name is Ulka. I work for the RIPE NCC. I'm a part of their comms team, and I've worked a lot with Miriam, and she suggested that since IETF does open up their comms calls, it might be nice if someone from the RIPE NCC joined in. And today seems like a particularly lucky day because we are in the process of redoing our website. So these are sort of familiar issues, and it's really interesting to hear how you guys are approaching it. Thank you. Uh yeah, well, thank you very much for joining. I'm I'm Greg. You can see my name, um, and I work on ITF comms, um, and you probably know Miriam. And, and uh, Jay is the executive director of the ITF LLC. Dhruv is on the IAB and also the IAB outreach coordinator, uh, and uh, longtime participant. And Cindy is in, with the ITF secretariat, and. Uh, basically runs things, I think, um, and uh, also has lots of experience with the ITF uh, website world, having just led the revamp of the Internet Architecture Board website. <laughs> so, so, so welcome. Um, yeah, so thanks for coming. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and it will be posted, just so you know, um, but feel free to jump in and ask questions if you have any questions about things that we cover or have already covered. Happy to go back. Small group. Um, okay, I haven't heard any other questions about the website, but feel free to jump in if you have other issues you want to ask about. Um, uh, maybe one context setting thing to say is that the www.itf.org website is just one website that makes up this constellation of websites in the ITF universe. Um, or Galaxy, I guess it would be the right way to say it. Um, there are sites like the www.iab.org um, and other sites like datatracker.ietf.org, which is more, you know, the day-to-day -day work of the ITF gets done. Um, and one of the challenges that, um, one of the aspects I should say that Jay and I are thinking about is how we connect these different sites together and make them intelligible to people who may not be fully aware of the Full galaxy of things, or the full constellation. So uh, that's another that's another part of the of the puzzle. Um, yeah. So uh, as you have probably, if you've read ahead, then you probably can see. And I will just read um, to get things started. But feel free to ask questions. Um, all the ITF meetings, including this one, have recordings. Um, posted uh, and, and including every session at a, at a plenary meeting, have their recordings posted uh, programmatically pretty much uh, for the most part to the um, ITF YouTube channel. This has a lot of advantages so people can go back and find recordings um, uh, when they're already on YouTube. So it very much is the idea of going to where people are already watching videos. Um, but currently those videos have um, uh, 
limits because they're posted uh, using titles that aren't very understandable to people who aren't, aren't or aren't already in the know, and they don't have descriptions really. So Medico is working on using the full working group name, which often has um, cues about what kind of technology they're working on in that working group to make them better, more findable, and also will include descriptions and links to the uh, groups that they are connected with. So this is a step towards making those recordings more useful for people who are looking for things. Um, yeah. Uh, a, the next item is just a plug um, because uh, uh, we're actively looking for um, things like blog posts from people who are doing work in the ITF. And uh, so I often um, will talk to people uh, at ITF meetings and get or or hear about things at ITF meetings that will lead to ideas for blog posts. And the, the reason that we like these is because the posts are ways to um, expose the work of the ITF uh, to audiences that uh, don't sit through working group meetings, but for which nonetheless, the work is really important. A uh, really great example of this is the WebRTC work uh, where um, WebRTC is used in video conferencing by millions, if not billions of people around the world. Um, but WebRTC as a working group, um, yeah, kind of inscrutable. And so when, when we published the RFCs for WebRTC, we did a whole series of blog posts that explain what WebRTC is, how it's used, um, where the ITF played a role. Um, similarly for things like uh, Quick or messaging layer security. So we have a few in the works. Um, always looking for more. So if you have ideas or suggestions, uh, let me know. And uh, we'll be uh, more actively letting working group chairs, for example, know about this as well. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I have a, I have a question, yeah. Greg. Um, yeah, I know this is like buzz from, from the past, but as you know, in the old edu, when I was in the edu team, I, we we had these we developed some of those technical tutorials. They're probably out of date by now, but maybe some aren't. I don't know. Are they going to be included in this, or is, are you looking at those, or are you starting from scratch? Yeah, technical tutorials. As it's a yeah, um, the, the so. Um, those are also valuable. I think that's something that EODER has talked about a lot, uh, trying to get, um, for example, working group chairs or area directors to give updates on what technologies are being done uh, or worked on or where things are going in a particular area. Um, and so these are a little bit different in that they focus on very, very particular protocols. Um, uh, so I guess the short answer to your question is the technical tutorials, as I understood them under EDU, um, aren't really part of this particular thing, but I know that Andrew may want to talk more about this as well. Um, I know they're still being discussed in, in EODER. Yeah, because you also just mentioned, and I thought that I always thought it was, um, and, and, and somebody actually mentioned this to me the other day, the area updates. I'm not sure if they're still still done, but uh, that was apparently um, something people liked. And um, But is this something I should talk to EODER about, or are you the link to that, or how, how does this work? Yeah, those are typically organized under EODER, but it's definitely something I mean, here. Uh, something we can take up. Yeah, I think the area update uh, discussions usually, like, you know, every ISG tries to do things differently. And there was an ISG in the past which really used to like area updates. And they, in fact, ask all the working group chairs to go and update the working group description so that the description can be pulled into a common report but then it fizzled out <laughs> and uh, it, like you no know, new isg comes in and tries something new so right now the the idea of area updates and even in the area meetings there was a time where each chair used to go up and give an update those things have changed a little bit and we keep trying new things right now the thinking is that it's not as useful and that's why it's not being used as much so just an information that you might find useful Okay, I'm just taking notes and um, 
Yes. Okay, I, I might bring this up with EOD um, to see or maybe DISC, see if maybe some, some, you know, an updated form of a more useful form of that might be something that could be reintroduced. Yes, and for sure in the LLC comms context, we would support um, those, uh, uh, you know, if, if they were organized by making sure people knew about them and promoting them and so forth. Um, I will say, uh, this has a different label, but there is a, um, there have been these um, technology deep dives that folks on the IESG have organized, and those have been very, very well received. So it's slightly different packaging, maybe, to the technical tutorials. Um, but those have been really, real received. And if you believe YouTube, they're like the highest viewed videos on, you on our YouTube channel. So um, super appealing. Uh, um, Greg, regarding our blogs, do you know which blogs have been like, I, I, we can disregard the news blogs because those are important updates for our community. And that's fine. But with respect to things that we were asking working group chairs or ITF highlights, uh, is there any data on it? Like what's more popular, what people actually read more that we can, based on that, we can target even to, uh, that is the right time to write a blog for a working group. Is it when they have achieved an output or when they are just starting? That part is also not very clear in my mind. Like when should we actually reach out to people uh, to write a blog? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So, um... Uh, we do have some limited an analytics on this website, um, uh, and it's something that we've looked into, for example, um, around uh, the summary blog posts for meetings, Drew, in the past that you've, you've helped with. Um, uh, and we can definitely do a better job of sharing those. Um, in terms of when the timing is for these kinds of posts, uh, in the past, we've been kind of um, uh, more conservative in that we didn't want to write about a particular protocol until, uh, and when I say we, I mean the people involved. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean alone making the decision, but the people involved didn't want to write about a particular protocol until the RFC was published because things could change until the RFC is published. But more recently we've been, um, and again, I say we, but I mean the people involved have been looking at posts uh, more incrementally updated. So maybe when, working group last call happens so that you know it's pretty stable or uh, the ISG submits a, a document for publication as an RFC or simply as an update. Um, so for example, I think there was a recent post about uh, MLS uh, that wasn't tied to the publication of the, of the RFC, but rather just here's, here's all the industry people who have worked together to address this issue. Um, and here's the solution that they think is going to work going forward. Okay. Uh, did that answer your question, Drew? Do those things address? Um, yeah, thanks, Greg. Thanks. Okay. Can, I, can I just add? Um, so I, I think, um, Miriam, there may be some pushback from trying to go to EOD to um, necessarily initiate new things like this, because EOD is meant to be a coordinating um, thing where people come to report on the various different work taking place rather than a management thing. Um, that's certainly the, what Lars as the responsible AD um, wants it to act. So um, if the um, requirement is for area updates, then I think that would be better done by going directly to the IESG. Um, or with Greg going to the ISG to, to for that to, to be initiated there through um, uh, through the area directors or something as those the people responsible for the areas um, possibly they, of course they can delegate it um, and then that then gets reported to EOD as something new that is going on as a thing rather than them moaning or managing it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for um, updating me on, on the process. That's probably changed since I was involved there back it, in the day. It, it just—it's mainly because if we start with EOD, it'll just the, the yeah the, the ISG and Lars will just say no, not want that to go. You know. So yeah, just avoid getting yeah. us falling into the mud straight away. Yeah. 
And I'm not right. talking there as an LLC board member either. And you know, I was just thinking more, no, um, you know, how to reach out to how to, I don't know, more in the outreach terms and how to expand to new participants, what all these areas do and what's currently hot. And what no, 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 no. I can tell you the value in it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And as, as Drew said, it does depend on individual ADs at the end anyway, uh, in many cases. And the technology deep dive approach is essentially what Jay's uh, talking about. But yeah, that's a good clarification. Um, okay, uh, just pausing because I know it takes a while to mute unmute in Medico, though it's greatly improved since the last in the last few months, so it's much speedier than it used to be. Uh, thank you, Medico. Um, just a quick note here that uh, based on basically looking at um, uh, how we use meeting photography have done in the past um, and some questions about um, how we can do it better. We're, we're going to be proposing a new approach or taking a new approach, basically starting with 119, where we just do um, photography at one meeting per year and then make those photos much more widely available. Um, so uh, we had previously been doing much more than that and really just weren't seeing the the value for that investment. So, um, yeah. So we will have photography at 119. It'll be a local photographer, um, and we'll be able to use those for for the remainder of the year. Regarding uh, photography, Greg, is this something that usually uh, the sponsorship people have anything to say in it? Because sometimes what I would think is like, if I'm sponsoring, and I would I would like to have some good photos of the event to show back like, okay, uh, and if we don't provide that, would that have any issue? Just a thought. No, that's an excellent point. And it's definitely something um, that we've um, thought about. Uh, surprisingly, in speaking with Stephanie McCammon of the secretary who deals with sponsors, um, many of the sponsors don't have very complicated um, photography requirements. There are always exceptions about hosts who want to make sure that we document particular things. Um, and for those cases, of course, we'll consider uh, photography, but usually we can cover off what sponsors are needed by, you know, taking our own photographs um, using the excellent cameras that now exist in portable devices everywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, for sure, we've had cases where the hosts of a meeting want a particular level of photography that we probably couldn't meet on our own. Um, and we would we would uh, support that as well. Great. Um, thanks for the question. Um, yeah. Then we're into the FYIs. I didn't hear any uh, suggestions about other things to add to the agenda. So I'm just going to run through the FYIs very quickly. Um, if you want to jump in and ask questions about anything else that's going on, please do. Um, we're still working on collateral planning and, and uh, production. We're going to start to move into production. Uh, the first document we usually produce each year is uh, the snapshot. And um, with the community survey, if you haven't filled it out, fill it out. Um, closing next week, uh, we'll have the data we need for this, uh, this year's snapshot. And so we expect to have that very early in February. <clears throat> and for folks not familiar, this is just sort of a very high level one page um, collection of things like how many RFCs are published, how many internet, dra internet drafts were uh, uh, submitted, how many people total attended all ITF meetings, those kinds of things. So uh, the breakup of the ITF community based on survey responses, those sorts of things. Um, so it's a useful one page summary of what the ITF has done in the previous year. Uh, and then we'll start moving into other collateral, for example, reworking sponsorship documents or um, some longer pieces like the, the annual report that we do uh, once the full information from the previous year is available, like financial information. Um, visual style guide. So uh, we uh, last produced sort of like a standard style guide for our, our visual designs um six years ago seven years ago so we took a look at that and updated it including 
new colors, <laughs> um, a, a, a standard way to accommodate um, things like, um, you know, the IETF endowment if we need to. So just sort of taking nothing fancy, definitely not like the 100 level, 100 page, the level of a 100 page brand book that a lot of companies might have, but just some general guidelines to help us, uh, including folks who produce materials for our meetings, have a consistent look and feel. Um, uh, yeah, so this has moved a long way since uh, I started getting involved in the ITF, and it just adds a level of um, sort of coordination um, across all of our materials that's um, useful to convey that we're, you know, talking to each other. Um, the Tau update, yeah, so the Tau was mentioned before uh, in the website, and if you are on the Tau Discuss list, you've seen that Niels, the current editor of the Tau, has suggested retiring the Tau, and there was a draft, uh, an internet draft about that, and I think it's now, uh, got it got pretty f positive feedback and support, so I think uh, next steps are underway to sort of formally retire the Tau, and um, for folks who uh, are unfamiliar, um, the DAO started as in the late 1990s as a way to get all these dot-com bubble people who were coming to the ITF sort of uh, up to speed with what the ITF was about. And so if you go look and read the very first version of the DAO, it's quite interesting because it definitely has that feel of, you know, this uh, thing called the internet that is now super popular and attracting a lot of money and therefore a lot of people getting involved, uh, just trying to give people context for what they're getting into. Um, but over the years, it really um, uh, morphed into quite a long, long document and one that was useful as a pointer uh, because people could just say, go read the DAO if you're new and it would give you a, it was intended to give you sort of a, um, a starting point. Uh, but the challenge was it didn't get updated very often, and so it became out of date. It got to be quite, quite long, so it was very hard to navigate or manage uh, if you weren't willing to invest a um, considerable amount of time to read it all. Um, and um, in fact, despite moving to a new process, it in, as a web being published as a web page versus an RFC, it actually got updated um, almost less frequently than it did when it was published as an RFC. So um, the idea is to um, take a fresh approach that includes all the information that uh, that still produces all the information that a new person to the ITF needs, but present it in a way that makes it much more manageable, as Jay talked about, sort of breaking it down into smaller, more digestible chunks, taking a tone that is maybe more attuned to what a current reader uh, or, or current new participant or potential participant is expecting. Um, and to update it, um, update those things more regularly. Um, there will still be, uh, and this is in the, in the internet draft, there will still be the idea of there should be a easily to remember, easy to convey starting point for new people. So you can go say, you know, we don't know what it is, but it'll be something like www.itf.org slash start here or something like that, where if you want to have someone go somewhere one place where they can get a start on things they can you can tell them where that is easily um, but then they can find the information that they're looking for in a much easier way than rather than having to go through you know 12 20 pages of a of a text only format document so that's more of an update than i was planning to give but that's a little context if folks are watching this and maybe not familiar with the DAO. Okay, uh, yeah, I think that is, that covers the agenda mostly. Uh, are there, is there anything else folks wanna talk about? Or questions? Okay, I've counted to more than six. I usually only count to six, but now, now we're more than six, so. Um, Great. Well, um, I want to quickly recap uh, what we talked about last uh, time, last month, about these meetings. And um, 
get any other ideas um, about that. Uh, we talked about having these basically once a month, which I'm fine with. Uh, works for me. It, it, uh, I find it useful to help organize things. Um, if other folks can join, uh, that's great. Uh, and um, we talked about moving to using, like I said, Medico and the regular group process. So thanks to Robert for um, and the tools team for setting this up um, as an ITF group. Uh, or a group in the ITF data tracker, I should say, so it's under the LC. Anyway, you can now find information about the meeting on the through the data tracker and on the ITF regular calendar. Um, we'll continue to do the regular posting of the agenda and recordings and notes afterwards. Uh, the one suggestion I would make is wanted to make is that for months with ITF meetings, um, we might either consider not holding this because those are usually pretty busy or doing something during um, the ITF meeting week uh, time. And those are kind of two extremes because people are super busy with other things during ITF meeting week already. So I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to uh, add something else. Um, uh, but I, so I, I this maybe this is more of an open-ended question you know like do people have strong feelings that we should do this one way or another during meeting months i think it may depend on what's going on at the time i'm one of those people that has a million other meetings during ietf week so the thought of adding one more is terrifying but also i can imagine a situation where there's something um really relevant going on that we would want to talk about and having that face time would be good Okay, thanks. Thanks, Cindy. Anybody else have strong feelings about this? Or mild feelings about it? No? Well, I think we're already very busy, so I wouldn't add anything else on personally. Um, and we have EOD, which is um, part of the overall ecosystem of stuff around communications where we're reporting on things. And so perhaps the, the meeting is better as the, at the point for um, uh, you know, the, the, the reconciliation and review and reflection process that takes place there through EOD, rather than us um, adding more to it during the meeting. Yeah, that's a good thought. OK. Um, I have typed a suggestion, which is that we basically, if there's inf important information to uh, convey during a meeting month, We'll look at existing ways to do that, like EODER, or if there's a working group chairs forum, or something like that. Uh, those kinds of things. So, and there's always email. Fantastic. Uh, any other comments, questions? I, maybe just a meta thing. I saw last time there were a lot more people um, participating. So I wonder if you did anything different with announcing it or was it just um, the first time we really got excited and jumped on it and then felt like, well, you're doing a great job. You know, I don't need to pay attention to it. Um, right. I don't know if you thought I had any thoughts on that. but um... Yeah, uh, uh, for sure. It's something that uh, I, of course, noticed. I think I think you've hit um, on one of it. It's just like the novelty factor is worn off. So like, OK, I don't really need to come to these meetings, which, which is actually perfectly fine. Boring is good uh, in sometimes like if things are working. This is all about how things are working. And if think, people think things are working well, that's great. Um, we did rotate the timing of this. So this is not as convenient for the West Coast, for example, uh, as Cindy can attest. Um, and it may be just individual um, preferences for timing. Um, that is one thing that we talked about is to rotate stuff. So I, I do intend to keep rotating the time of the day. Um, and it could be that the topics themselves, like the individual topics, were not as exciting as they were last time. I haven't done a comparison, but they did change in it. So. Okay, no, I'm not, I was, you know, not judging like if it's good or bad, but uh, no, rotating the time is definitely good. I, I'm not suggesting you, you know, always pick the European time would be great for me, but no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, people can see the minutes and the agenda. And so they decide if they want to participate or not. Yeah. No, great. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, okay, well, I think we might we might have covered the agenda and everything that we need to talk about today. I want to thank everybody for joining, for sure. I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share uh, information. And if questions come up, ask. you can ask me directly, or as I said, we use the admin-discuss at ietf.org email list uh, to talk about these things. And yeah, and uh, Ulka, I, I uh, am looking forward to seeing the right website. I'd love to have a side conversation with you about your process on that. So I might follow up if you don't mind. Please feel free to follow up uh, and we hope to be live with the website. Uh, it's taken us about a year and we hope to be live with it very soon. So. Well, uh, congratulations in advance. Okay, well, with that, I'll uh, look forward to seeing everybody online, uh, yeah, and on the internet. Bye. Thanks, thanks, Greg. I think this is a great initiative. Looking forward to the next one.